I'd like to uh, bring to remembrance a couple of the things that God has been uh, leading our church in this past, past month, actually. I've been thinking about and keeping tabs of certain messages and certain ways that God has been. It's been a quite an intense month. Quite an intense. I want to bring us to remembrance. Last week, Pastor Susie, she preached a message on lessons that we can learn from the persecuted church around the world. It was quite a heavy message, but I walked away feeling so blessed, so convicted, and just kind of, I got shook. <laughs> I know many of us got shook, you know, and she preached one of the couple key lessons that Pastor Susie mentioned, um, one, the last one actually, really stuck to me, and the last lesson that we as a church can learn from the persecuted church that she shared was, the persecuted church, they show us, they show the world the worthiness of Christ. Meaning, what they do and how they live is because to them, Christ is worth it. To the degree of sacrifice and to the degree of extravagant, just the way that they live unto the Lord is measured by the degree of how, how much Christ is their treasure. And that really stuck with me. The week before that, she preached on what it means to intercede for this nation. This past uh, month, I don't, know, I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's become very apparent that we have been ramping up our intercession and prayer. We've been praying for this nation in particular, for Korea, uh, because of the elections that happened. We've been praying for Ukraine. We've been praying for the nations. And at the same time as we're interceding for this nation, I believe it's God's providence that in our house churches, which we began this past week, we have been studying, and this past week, if you are in a house church, we've been studying what does it mean to live out the gospel by loving the city or the nation that God has placed us in. All this together, I can't help but believe, I can't help but believe that the way that God is directing our church in this season, what I feel is, he's getting us to think more outwardly. He's getting us to think more outwardly. Outside of ourselves individually, and outside of ourselves as a church, God is leading us and teaching us what it means to be others-oriented. That's the general theme I feel like God is, he's been doing here in our church. And it's very uncomfortable because if you're selfish like me, you know, you get shocked and you're like, the flesh in you just kind of resists so much. I hope I'm not by myself here. <laughs> So as I'm thinking about this, this past week, preparing for the sermon, I began reflecting on God's story, specifically in what he is writing in this nation in Korea. I began reflect. I've been here about, for about 10 years. And in these past uh, 10 years, when I first came, I was, you know, in my early 20s. And I'm like, I came really just hungry to want to know God's heart. I began you know, I'm, I grew up in the States, but I'm Korean. I didn't really know anything about Korea. I came here just hungry, wanting to learn about the history of this nation and the history of the church of this nation. I wanted to know God's story in this nation because I wanted to jump in and be a part of it. Do you know God's history with this nation? <laughs> Korea, this peninsula. It is a rich history. It's a beautiful story. That not, that, uh, not a beautiful story that he has written. It is a beautiful story that he is writing. And I pray for all of us here as a church that we would join in on those pages that he's writing. I ask God to remind me of his heart once again for Korea and for the city of Seoul. I've been here, like I said, for about 10 years. And in my early years here, I remember... Uh, a couple times going to this very specific location here in Korea, a very 
meaningful place for me. This place is one station away from here, near Hapjong Station. It's called Yangwajin Foreigner Cemetery. Yangwajin Foreigner's Cemetery. And the first time I went there, I walked around and seeing the graves, seeing the epitaphs, and, and the messages on those graves of the missionaries that have died in this nation, sowing into this nation, I, can't, I couldn't help but just be moved by tears so much. Even my third time and fourth time there, it's like a different tomb stands out for me, and I'm just like so moved. I, I encourage you guys, if you guys haven't been there, I highly encourage you guys, check it out. It's right here in our backyard. <laughs> even, even house churches, take a field trip. Take a field trip together and see what God does. See what God says. See what he begins to do in our hearts. I recalled and remembered certain missionaries. Uh, Pastor Susie mentioned one of the missionaries in her message last week. The man who came on a boat, and right when he stepped on foot, he got martyred. But before he got martyred, he threw a couple copies of the Bible onto the land, and they used it as wallpaper. That man's name was Robert Germain Thomas. I remember right across the street, it's, it's pretty surreal. Right across the street, there's a university called Yonsei University. Any people who graduated from there? Yeah, yeah, I see you. I see you, John. <laughs> right across the street from this church, there's Yonsei University. And God had sent this man named Horace Underwood to make that school, among many other people. Right next to that, across the street, there's Severance Hospital. Man, it's surreal to think that God had sent many people, including a man named Horace Allen, to make this hospital. A mile down the road, there's a woman by the name of Mary Scranton who made the school, Iwa Women's University. It's crazy to think that God had handpicked these people and they had obeyed the Lord and came all the way to this land to not just create these institutions that are still alive today, but to bring in the gospel. It's surreal to think about. Wow, I tell God, you do love this nation. You do love this nation. But of all these missionaries... For this time around, this past week, as I was preparing this, this sermon, one particular missionary came to mind that I just kind of paused and stopped at. Her name is Ruby Kendricks. Ruby, Ken <laughs> Ruby Kendricks. In the late 1800s in America, there was a move of God titled the Student Volunteer Movement. The Holy Spirit was pouring out all across the nation amongst college students. And it is said that more than 20,000 students committed their lives to overseas missions. One of those students was this woman right here, Ruby Kendricks. At the age of 24, anybody 24 in here? <laughs> Yorbang. Think about this, guys. At Yorbang's age, at the age of 24, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, Yorbang. <laughs> at the age of 24, she set sail August 29th, 1907, from Texas. Anybody from Texas here? From Texas. Nobody from Texas? <laughs> from Texas. Oh, there we go, Emma. <laughs> from Texas, at the age of 24, it says, she set sail. She didn't book a flight. She set sail. Can you imagine? From Texas to Korea, on a boat. She set sail for many, many months on, in 1907, the same year as the Pyongyang revival. God's providence, right? When she got here, you know what she did? She led morning prayers. She taught English. And she looked after sick children. That's it. That's all she did. Nothing monumental. There's no Yonsei University, Iwa University. There's no Severance Hospital to remember her name by. She just looked after the sick, taught English with her whole heart. 
in 1908, one year later, less than one year later, she died of appendicitis at Severance Hospital right across the street. At her request, she was buried in Korea near Hap Jong Yok. There her grave is. And on her grave, you know what it says? There's a picture of it on here. Her last words home were, if I had a thousand lives, Korea should have them all. Some of you guys, you've heard this before. This young woman, Yeobang's age, 24, saying, <laughs> <laughs> she's like sinking. <laughs> If I had a thousand lives, Korea should have them all. How, how did she gain such a big heart for Korea? One year here. Just one year. That obedience to the Lord, she came. And her name has caused ripple effects all across history. We remember her name today. No monument, simple obedience. There's something about reading the stories of missionaries and even martyrs that not only stir up amazement in our hearts, stirs up awe in our hearts for, wow, these people are amazing. Not only does it do that, but it causes us to wonder. It shakes us up, and it's like, man, what do they know about Jesus that I need to know? It makes me wonder. Ruby Kendrick was a sign in wonder. She was a sign that pointed to Christ, and her life makes me wonder, man, do I know Jesus like she knew Jesus? Is Jesus worth it to me as Jesus was worth it to him? The title of my message today is called Crazy in Love. <laughs> Q. Q Beyonce. Da -da 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 -da, right? Crazy in love. That's the, that's the title that came to mind as I was preparing these. These missionaries that came to this nation, they were crazy in love with Jesus. And I was reminded of the passage we read together today in 2 Corinthians, where Paul says that well known verse. Paul was also crazy in love, where he says, The love of Christ compels or controls us, controlled him to live the way that he did. I was reminded of this, of this verse. I want to share with you guys a little bit of the context of this passage in 2 Corinthians. It's 2 Corinthians, meaning this is not the first letter. There's a reason why Paul is writing again to this church. Paul was sent to Corinth, planting this church in the power of the gospel, this church became a booming church. And then when he went away to continue his missionary journey, he heard such heartbreaking news that this church was being attacked, infiltrated. So much division was taking place in this church, and this church was straying from the gospel. So he came back, reconvinced them, and it was a painful return for Paul to come back. And he's pleading with this church. And then he leaves, and he just can't shake it off. So he writes 2 Corinthians to this church. So as we can tell here, the tone of this, the tone of this book here, the tone of this letter is that where he is he's pleading with them. He is trying to convince them, or should I say, he's trying to reconvince them of this gospel. Hey, please. Come back to this. His heart is breaking. That's the tone of this passage right here. What's going on at this church? Rather than the church gaining influence and becoming salt and light to the area of Corinth, rather than that happening, the opposite is happening. The church is being influenced by the culture around them. The impact of the gospel at this church is slowly subsiding. And the impact of the culture around them is slo slowly being exalted. Something else was replacing the gospel. What is going on out in the Corinth area? 
Corinth was an area, it was a city of wealth, city of commerce, a city filled with pagan idolatry, various Greek ideologies and Greek, the worship of many Greek gods. People were going to these temples and sacrificing and worshiping these Greek gods. Why? Not because they love the gods, because they want the gods to do something for them. Worshiping other gods for personal gain was rampant. If I were to describe Corinth in one word, it would be Corinth was a place of lust. Lust. Lust in every way. Sexual lust. Sexual immorality. The lust for power. The lust for wealth. The lust to prop up oneself. The lust for reputation. Lust was getting into the church, and love for Christ was leaving the church. In this outside culture of Corinth, it was cultivating self-focus, self-preservation, and narcissism. That's essentially what lust is. It gets us to be selfish and live for ourselves. And it's not just Corinth, brothers and sisters. It's much like the developed world today. It sounds all too familiar, doesn't it? And I wonder, man, I wonder, Lord, where our church is. In Corinth, false teachers were coming in to destroy the integrity of Paul. False teachers, these people were coming into the church while he was gone, and they're gossiping, they're talking smack about Paul. They're saying, hey, you're going to listen to him? And you know what they were convincing the Corinthian church of? They were saying, Paul, he's mentally unstable. He's crazy. Why would you follow a poor man like, just look at him. Why would you follow a poor man like him? And the church, they were taking it in. They started doubting the, Paul and his message. They brought in a way of life that focused more on earthly emphasis rather than eternity. This is what kind of like the ideology and the spirit that was coming into the church of Corinth. Focus not on the eternal, but the temporary. Focus not on the eternal, internal, but on the external. Focus not on the unseen, but the tangible. Focus not on others, but on self. These thoughts, these ideologies are permeating the church even today. And we got to be aware. In short, the church was straying from the gospel that Paul once preached, and he's pleading with them, come back. Come back. If we were, let's just say hypothetically, maybe not hypothetically, but hypothetically, if we were to be like this church in Corinth, and if we were to be slowly pulling away from gospel living, what are some of the things that we should be reminded of? How would Paul come into this church and plead with us? And I just want to share three things that I see in this passage. The first thing Paul would remind us is, hey, Be eternally focused, not nearsighted. Be eternally focused, not nearsighted. The passage that we read today, actually, we didn't read the verse before, but let me read the verse before, because the passage we read today, it starts with therefore, you know, so we got to read the verse before. And the verse before, it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Paul is reminding the church, hey, stop being so nearsighted. We're running a race here. Let me remind you, each and every one of us, all of us have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is going to be a loss. We learned this in house church last year. We talked about eternal rewards, right? 
there's going to be a loss of eternal rewards potentially. But it's not just doom and gloom. It's, God, I'm going to affirm you. I'm going to give you these eternal rewards. Paul is reminding them, hey, stop thinking about temporary, tangible rewards now. Live for eternity. Live for the rewards in the future. Don't think about, church, don't think about your status and reputation here on this earth now. Think about the position that God will place you in in the eternal kingdom. Paul is reminding them, think eternally. Second thing that we see that I think Paul would tell us is, walk in the fear of the Lord, not the fear of man. Walk in the fear of the Lord, not in the fear and approval of man. He starts off right there in what we read. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. You see, why he's saying this is because, like I shared earlier, the whole ideologies and thought process that's infiltrating the church, it's all cultivating in people's hearts the fear of man, the fear and approval of man. People are becoming more self-focused, more conscious, and more insecure comparing themselves to the world's standards. So the fear of man is being cultivated. But God is saying here, hey, knowing the fear of the Lord, I'm convincing you, hey, know the fear of the Lord. Walk in the fear of the Lord. Care only about what God would say to them when they face him on judgment day. He didn't care about his reputation and how they looked. Even if, brothers and sisters, even if Paul knew, even if he knew he looked crazy, crazy in the eyes of the world around him, he did not waver. He did not fear man. He feared God. He feared God. It says later on in that passage, it says, Paul says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Meaning, hey, these people, the false teachers that are coming to the church, they're saying all this gossip about me, that they're saying I'm crazy and stuff. Paul is not denying, actually, that he's crazy. He's saying this, hey, if it's true, if I am crazy, like they say I am, it is for God. It is for God. He was viewed as crazy and out of his mind for living the way that he did. People thought he was crazy. But Paul, he said, you can call me crazy, but I'm going to stick to the truth. I'm going to stick to the gospel. He was crazy. What kind of man would head straight into a crowd that he knew was going after him, trying to attack him? What kind of man would go back to the place where he got stoned? for being a follower of Christ. What kind of man would go back into that? A crazy man. (laughs) A crazy man. He's saying, call me crazy, but he was not mentally unstable. He knew exactly what he was following. You know, like many of the persecuted church today and the missionaries that I mentioned today, and all around the world, they had such a different way of life, a different perspective, They had a complete different operating system. They weren't Windows, they were Mac. I'm just joking, right? Like they had, they, they were just, they just operated so differently. They had a different motivation. And I want to warn us, there is coming a day, and we see even glimpses of it today, where being a Christian, we're going to be seen more and more as crazy. The values of the world and the values of Christ is going to be more and more separated. And there's going to be more and more reason where people are going to call us crazy. Even friendly fire, even Christians are going to say, why would you do that? That rhetoric is going to increase. It will seem more radical to be a Christian as we move forward. It already is in parts of the world. When I was in Africa, Africa, when I was there, it was a 98% Muslim country, and, and 
you know, when I talked to the converts there, when I lived with the converts there, 100%, they're going to be abandoned by their families. They have economic disadvantage, persecuted. All their family always tries to convince them every time they see them, are you crazy? Are you crazy? And I'm sure in their hearts, just like Paul, they're like, call me crazy, but I'm sticking with the truth. I'm sticking with the gospel. The third thing, and I believe the main thing that Paul wants to remind, would remind the church is, live compelled by the love of Christ, not mere human compassion. Live compelled and controlled by the love of Christ. The Greek word for controlled, you know, in NIV it says live compelled by the love of Christ. Here it says live controlled by the love. The Greek word is suneko. Can we all say suneko? Suneko. I looked into this word as a word study, and there were words that I preferred that really captured the essence of this. And it wasn't just control and and you know, compelled, it was, I like the word, it was captivated and arrested. Captivated and arrested, like taken, fully taken over. Paul is saying, the love of Christ soon echoed me. The love of Christ arrested me. It's not, I can't get free of this love. I can't get free of this crazy love. And my prayer, church, is that the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel message would suneko us, would arrest us. That we can't help, we can't help but live a certain way in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, what sunekos us? What, what arrests us? What captivates us? As in, what is the driving force in, that causes the motives of our heart, the way we live day in and day out? What soon echoes us? Is it the fear of man or is it the fear of God? Is it the gospel or is it the patterns of this world? What soon echoes us? And Paul is saying, to the church of Corinth, let me remind you guys what Sunna called me. I'm going to remind you guys, Corinth, and I hope that it Sunna calls you again. He says that all, he has died for all. Jesus has died for all. He died for me, he says. He died for me. There's a game we once played at our church a long time ago. It's called like the syllable emphasis game where we played a game where, let's say, New Philadelphia Church. Some of you guys know. It starts with emphasizing each word where it's like New Philadelphia Church and then New Philadelphia Church. Come do it with me. New Philadelphia Church. New Philadelphia Church. New Philadelphia Church. New Philadelphia Church. <laughs> Why am I bringing this up? It's such a serious time as this, right? <laughs> um, when I was preparing, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that led me to do that exercise with this simple phrase, He died for me. I'm going to just read it slowly for us. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. For me. He died for me. Let's go through this slowly because this is the meat of the sermon. He died for me. Who died for me? He died for me. The sinless, perfect, eternal, holy God. The creator of the heavens of, and the earth, the uncreated God, the triune God, he died for me. What did he do? He 
died for me. He didn't just forgive me and take me in. He didn't just let justice slide. He sent his one and only son. And how did he take me in? He sent his one and only son to die, to take on our sin. And he died upon that cross, and he says to them, he, he who knew no sin, he literally became sin on our behalf that we might know righteousness. He died for me. He took nails in his hands. He took a crown of thorns. He went through all that pain. He died for me. What reason did he die? He died for me. He chose to do this because he actually wanted me. He wasn't like, I need to be true to my character. I can't be contradictory. He's like, no, I'm going to do this for you, Paul. I'm going to do this for you, church. I'm going to do this for you, my beloved. And lastly, he died for me. He died for you. He died for Paul. And I have nothing, we have nothing to contribute. We have no merit to contribute. You know what we do have to contribute? The only thing that we bring is not our merit. We bring our demerit. Our contribution is we bring our sin. We bring our unfaithfulness. We bring our brokenness. And I'm thinking, what is man that he is mindful of me? He died for me? Paul's like, I used, to, I used to persecute the church. I used to talk smack about the church. Like, he, he died for me? He died for me? He wants me? He did all that for me? He died for me. He reconciled me. Paul continues. He adopts me. He gives me a new status. He calls me a new creation. He doesn't even forgive me. He says, the old is gone, the new has come. He puts his righteousness on me. We have a new creation. He offers us a new way, a new way of living. He offers us freedom. He gives us, he entrusts us the greatest message of all time. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He calls us sons and daughters, but he also calls us ambassadors for Christ. He calls us to represent him. What is this? What is this? He died for me. There's another epitaph. When I first went to Yangwajin Foreigner Cemetery, for some reason, I, I paused at this one, one epitaph, and I was looking at the tomb. And it said such a simple statement. And that's the first time I remember at that spot, I began to cry. I began to weep. It was a missionary by the name of John Heron. John Heron. And I was walking around those tombs, and I was saying, God, like, why did they do this? <laughs> why did they come here to this hermit nation? A nation where they died. They were persecuted. A nation where it was disease-ridden everywhere. People were dying of disease all the time. Why would they ride a ship all the way over here? And it says this, very simple. It says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That's all it said on that tomb. The Son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. And John Heron, his message is, it's as simple as that. The love of Christ has soon echoed me. The love of Christ has arrested me. This is what compels him. This is what compels the persecuted church. This is what compelled the missionaries to this nation. This is what compelled the cloud of witnesses 
in the heavens, cheering us on in this race now. I pray that this is what will compel me and us as we move forward, as God is leading us to be more outward focused. It's the love of Christ that did this even unto death. Ruby Kendricks, less than a year here in Korea, her last letter that she wrote to her mom and dad, I'd like to read it for us. Dad, mom, This land, Joseon, is truly a beautiful land. They all resemble God. I see their good heart and zeal for the gospel, and I believe that in a few years, it will be a land overflowing with the love of Christ. I saw children walking over 10 miles barefoot to hear the gospel, and the love of God is so in them, and it encourages me. But the persecution is getting stronger. Two days ago, three or four of those who have accepted Christ less than a week ago have been dragged away and were martyred. Missionary Thomas and James were also martyred. There were orders from the mission board to return, but most missionaries are in hiding and worshiping with those whom they have shared the gospel with. It seems that they are all planning to be martyred. Tonight, I have a strong desire to return home. I remember you, Mom, who, who resisted to the last moment of me leaving the port because of the stories of the hate of the foreigners and opposition to the gospel. Dad, Mom, perhaps this may be the last letter I will be writing. The seed that was sown in, the, in our backyard before I came out here must be filling our neighborhood with flowers. Another seed bears many flowers in the land of Chozon, and they will be seeds to other nations. I will bury my heart in this land. I realize that this passion for Chozon that I have is not mine, but God's passion toward Chozon. Mom, Dad, I love you. This was a letter that she wrote in her short life here in this nation. And I ask myself, you know, I'm in this nation for however long. You and I are in this nation for however, however long. I read this and I was so convicted. I was like, am I planting seeds? Or am I enjoying the fruit and picking its flowers? You know, we may not receive the privilege of being remembered like the missionaries I mentioned, but that's not the point. That's missing the point. The point is we need a revival in our hearts of the gospel message. The point is we need revival in our hearts for the gospel to melt our hearts again. We need to identify and cut away all the ideologies and the ways of this world that has infiltrated the church. And we need to respond to Paul's call to come back to the gospel and let and sit there and park there, sit there in front of Calvary and remember that he died for me and let this love arrest me. It's like I just imagine a, an image of just us standing in front of the cross just with our hands up like this. Just arrest me, Lord. Just take me, capture me, captivate my heart. Be its driving force. I'm not here to pick flowers and eat its fruit. I want to plant seeds, Lord. I want to plant seeds, Lord. So if I ask Pastor Susie to come up, and we're going to spend some time praying. <clears throat> Let's all close our eyes. <laughs> You know, I'll be the first to admit that as I was preparing this sermon, I had to repent. I felt quite unworthy to preach this message. I had to repent. 
and ask the Lord to bring me to that place again. Church, will you join me? Can we come together to ask the same? Lord, bring me back to embrace Calvary. Would you suneko me? Would you, would you seize my heart? Everything else that's gripping my heart, would you, would you, would you free me from that which is gripping my heart? Would you grip my heart, Lord? on that truth that Jesus Christ the son of God he loved me and he gave himself for me he died for me just you and the Lord Holy Spirit we ask would you please increase your presence here would you help us? Would you blow upon this room? Open our eyes. Help our hearts to be tender again. Come, Holy Spirit.